I have some uh, posters uh, on on what you may have th thought was a defunct drug already, the interferons. Why are they still kicking around? Well, they're outside of the U.S. There is a there there is a part of the world, um, and uh, in those parts of the world where a lot of the newer expensive medicines are not available or are too expensive to be used, interferons still quite a, a useful agent in treating MS. We have very long-term data on interferon. One of them is going to be presented uh, from the CIS trial uh, using interferon beta-1b. And we've shown in Benefit 11, the manuscript has now been submitted, um, a safety profile that, is, that doesn't change no, no matter how long you take it. Now consider some of the newer agents. Do we have people on that drug or whichever drug for 10 plus years? to know what the cumulative toxicity is and do you expect to see things in 10 years of exposure that you might not see in two? And the answer is yes, but we did not see that with interferon. So that's one of the uh, important issues. And in the benefit trial, this was a drug that was given right after the first attack. So you'd think that in, in such an early stage, uh, you don't want to risk having any kind of toxicity. So we saw a very good safety profile. The other important uh, uh, aspect that we looked at was in the uh, interferon beta 1a trials, which are now almost uh, 22 years old. That population just simply isn't around today. Think about it. These are patients who had to even get into the study, had to have poser criteria, just two attacks in who knows how many years. The average patient came in with seven years of unchecked disease and then if you looked at the group of patients who actually are in the range of what we would call progressive patients so the EDSS 4 or plus we pooled the patients who had this relapsing phenotype from the PRISM study which was a relapsing remaining study and the spectrum study which was a secondary progressive study uh, and we looked at a sub, subgroup analysis of them and said well you know in such a group of patients everyone's saying now, you know, why would you use interferon? Um, it's going to have no effect. And if you looked at some of the current studies where people are dissecting out this, this type of, of population, higher EDSS, um, cutting that group out of today's populations of the current trials doesn't look at all like that same group 22 years ago where clearly they were progressive. And what we saw was an equal or as good an effect of repression of activity in that group using interferon as if they were in a younger group. So uh, this, this uh, thought, oh no, EDSS4, why would you use interferon? I mean, it doesn't make any sense if you buy the data that was there a long time ago. The treatment of MS is a lifelong treatment. The disease runs your life, doesn't sleep, uh, when, when the disease ramps up, you need to match it with, with therapies that are able to, to compete against the, the disease process to limit damage. Sometimes that involves using very aggressive therapies. Then what? You know, if, if we borrow from the approach that the cancer doctors use, uh, they know cancer will kill you. But they also know that chemotherapy will kill you. And, and it's, what they try to do is, is hit hard with the chemotherapy to drive the cancer to a low level or, or non-existent, but they know the cancer can come back. So they want to keep people on a therapy that might contain the growth of the cancer so that they uh, don't need to hit them again with the powerful stuff. Could we borrow from that and say in MS, uh, we could start with something like an interferon, but if the disease ramps up, we're going to have to come in with a more uh, uh, effective therapy, which often is a more toxic therapy, and, and try to limit the exposure, maybe a year, two, three, in order to contain the disease. There's no reason to think that people could not be backed down once the disease is maintained to a drug like interferon that might be able to hold it long term because you know it's safe, and that's the key. Uh, people are getting in trouble today because they're escalating and then they don't stop. And, or if they do stop, they have to stop suddenly because there's a toxicity 
And now we're hearing, and there's several reports here already, of the rebound phenomena you see, especially from stopping drugs like natalizumab, which is well known, and now fingolimod, with uh, uh, the ability to not uh, uh, really deplete the cells that are, are, uh, are, are causing the disease process. So they can, uh, they'll come back, and, and sure enough, they do. There are rare, rare, rare reports of some kidney dysfunction, and, but it's, you know, for a drug that's been around for 25 years, it's fairly innocuous. Compared, compared to some of the other drugs today, I mean, we certainly we don't have to deal with PML. Um, uh, herpes infections and viral infections, infectious illness are just not part of the arm uh, toxicity profile of this drug. We're also getting into some therapies that are quite exciting. The, the thought that we could actually repair is very novel and we're in clinical trials now with, with agents that might be able to do that. Uh, the antilingo one, for instance, is a, a molecule that's, that's just finished some early phase two testing um, and is showing some very promising results. If, if that could be exploited further and we can really show that we're able to repair, um, I can't imagine that treating MS is going to be, well, we'll start with this medication to stop inflammation and later on when we see the damage we'll add something to repair. I mean, no, you're going to be using these somewhat in combination or tandem or we're going to come up with a, an important sequence of drugs that uh, confer the greatest efficacy and the, and the least toxicity. That's where it's going to go. We're either going to be using combinations or sequences um, we heard yesterday, and there's a lot of effort uh, to develop biomarkers that help us to target what it is that's going on in a given patient. You could have two patients with exactly the same type of disease, even MRIs that look identical, but the underlying immunology may be different. And you may see something in the same patient that changes over time. And, and your inability to, say, uh, contain the disease with one drug that has one mechanism may be uh, an indication that that mechanism is no longer in play. And you, that's why switches work. You know, you go to a drug with a different mechanism of action, suddenly they're contained again. So uh, we're always playing catch up with MS, but, but we now have more tools, I think, to uh, be able to address things.